This week on Let's Make It, we have five sensors. Four of them work, one of them is flaky, but we're gonna go through five different sensors. I've kept promising sensors and this is the sensor week. And uh, we'll talk about all these sensors, pros and cons, how, show you the code, all that stuff. Come on up right after this. Today on Let's Make It, in episode six, I'm gonna finally get to what I promised you before, and that's sensors. And boy, we're gonna have some sensor fun today. We have five sensors that we're gonna go through, all for the Arduino. I actually have four different Arduinos sitting here, and we're gonna go through each sensor one at a time and look at some code, uh, talk about some of the difficulties that I actually had with a couple of the sensors, getting them to work, and also some difficulty that I had with that LCD shield. I'll talk about that as well. Um, and so you won't fall into the same issue. So the very first thing I wanna talk about is a, is a temperature sensor. Now I have other temperature sensors that are on the way. Uh, the one that I'm going to demonstrate today is works a little differently than the other ones because it's really a digital output um, from the temperature sensor where the other ones I'm gonna look at, the Dallas ones, are not digital outputs, they're actually analog outputs. So this is gonna work a little bit different, but this is actually a very great sensor because it gives you more information than the Dallas sensor does. This gives you humidity as well. Um, it gives it to you in Celsius or Fahrenheit and it does some other things in there as well. So it's a, it's a great sensor. It's not much more than the Dallas. It's more protected, so you're gonna see that in a second. It makes it a little bit harder to test with because you just can't grab hold of it and test it and get the temperature go up. It take, you can do that, but it just takes a little while for it to start realizing you're touching it. So I'm gonna hop over to um, the Arduino. Oops, where'd it go? So what we have here is the Arduino, which is on the bottom down here, the shield that I showed you last week. Uh, and then over here we have a breadboard and you see this little blue thing is a temperature sensor. It's kind of behind the wires of the camera, but you can probably see it better now. Uh, so inside of there is the, all the electronics for this temperature sensor. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is it's bouncing around saying what the temperature is in 25 degrees Celsius right now and it's 77 degrees, actually kind of warm in the studio right now. So it's gonna keep bouncing around, giving you humidity, and just gonna go around in a circle. And you see down at the bottom this word okay. That's one of the nice things about this sensor is there's ways you can check to make sure it's actually responding. And a good way for me to test that is if I take and I pull off the lead and we let it go through its cycle, and you'll see in the program why it's gonna take it one cycle to go through here it'll come back up and it'll say timeout error. So you now know that what you're getting back is not valid data, which is very nice. It's a, it's, and it's built into the way that the, the, the uh, chip works. So we can push it off to the side and you'll see it comes back up and it's okay and it's reading data. And it's actually not too difficult to learn to use. The biggest problem I had with this was the shield. I was initially thinking that these pins were, since they were above the Arduino pins, you know, came straight through. However, that's not the case. In fact, the pin that I'm using is actually pin 12, and pin 12 is, is normally up here if you look at the Arduino, if you look straight through the Arduino. So that took me for a loop for a little while until I figured out that it's not, I actually had to go through with a logic analyzer and figure out which pin was pin 12 or where the pins were. So uh, I will document some of the information I found about this because there's very little documentation about this shield out there and how it's wired. There's just a schematic and gives you jumper numbers, but nowhere on this board does it tell you what jumper is what. So the schematic doesn't really do you much good in that case. And the board on the back is black, which makes it very hard to follow runs as well. It looks pretty, but it makes it very hard to follow runs. So, okay, so back to the temperature sensor. All this temperature sensor has is um, three wires. The, actually, there's four pins on it, but the, the fourth pin is in non-connected pin. So I'm not quite sure what its purpose is there or if maybe it's something that they've repurposed another board or another chipset for. So you have obviously five volts to run it, and then you have your ground. And then what I have here is the green wire is actually the digital sensor wire. And this goes into a digital pin, like I'm using pin 12, which is a digital only pin on the Arduino, instead of going in through analog zero through five, which is how like the Dallas ones work, which I still have that one coming and I'll do other episodes with more sensors. In fact, I have a bunch more sensors coming. 
They're just not here yet. So when they get here, I'll do other episodes. But I figured for tonight, five of these was, was plenty. So let's go take a look at the code uh, that I have for the temperature sensor. And it actually is, you see I have the liquid crystal dot H because that's how I'm displaying the data. Now my other uh, sensors tonight, I decided just to use the serial print uh, just to demonstrate how they work. Uh, it was too hard to change everything around live here. So that's why I have uh, four different Arduinos, all of them with different uh, projects on them. And the simplest thing to do was just to um, use the serial print because it was connected all the time. The other thing is if I use that shield, a lot of the pins are used. So you use very few pins and you'll see some of the other projects require quite a few pins to actually work. So, all right, so back to the program. You see I'm including liquidcrystal.h. Like I said, that's for the shield. And then I include the library dht11.h. And this is actually something that I'll put a link to in the show notes. That's It's a library for this particular temperature sensor, which makes it very easy to use, actually. Then you see here at Liquid Crystal, I actually take and define uh, the 8, 9, and 4, 5, 6, 7 pins, which we talked about last week for this particular shield. And then I define the temperature sensor library and what pin it's on. Now, this is where I was having problems because when I put it on pin 12, I could never find where pin 12 was. I didn't know that that was the problem at first. I thought something was wrong with the temperature sensor, but it ends up being that I was not plugging into pin 12 like I thought I was. So uh, basically you define a library, say it's on pin 12. Now by doing this, you'll see in setup, I say attached to pin 12. I can do one or the other. I don't have to do both. I'm doing both just because I wanted to make sure it was working. I never took, I never took it back out. You could actually take out uh, the 12 here and it would be fine. Okay, so after we attach, we want to turn our LCD on. So I'm using a 16 uh, character two line LCD. And when it first starts up, it says, let's make it at the top. That's actually a leftover thing uh, from last week. And I wait one second. And that's just basically to let the temperature sensor um, come up. It doesn't have to be a whole second, but since I had let's make it on the screen, I just let me it one, one second. It does require, I think it's 10 microseconds to uh, get itself up. So the next thing we do in, the, in our loop is we then read the temperature sensor. And we define the variable of CHK. And we set the, set the cursor to the second line, the very first position. And what I'm going to do now is look and see what I got back. So I did the, the CHK back. And it's going to tell me if it's, if it's equal to 0, Everything's cool. Everything's working fine. We can talk to it. But if the library cannot talk or has other errors, for example, a negative one means I have a checksum error. So I've never seen this yet, but I assume that you can have noisy data, and that would be your checksum error. The one we just saw was the negative two, which was the timeout error, which basically means I'm not getting any data. And then the default, I say unknown error because it's an error that I'm not aware of or not documented. So then I come down and I set the cursor to the first line in the first position, and then I'm going to print the word humidity, and then I'm going to call the library, and I'm going to do a humidity. So I'm basically sending out the humidity, and then I'm adding a percent sign. And then I wait four seconds. I go back to the beginning of the line, and I print out temperature, and then I grab uh, DHT11 temperature. Now here's the thing, the default temperature that it reads is in Celsius. So you'll see that I put C here for Celsius. And you'll see right here, after I delay another four seconds and set the cursor back, I then call the Fahrenheit pro procedure. Now one thing you're gonna notice is temperature and humidity are variables. Fahrenheit is actually a function. So it's probably taking the Celsius value and converting it to Fahrenheit and returning that information to you. So you see then the F for Fahrenheit and then I wait another four seconds. Now the reason it took so long for it to say that there was nothing attached or it was a uh, timeout error was because I pulled that pin in the middle of these four second waits. So if I pulled the pin while it was displaying temperature, it would be another eight seconds until it got back to the top where it did the check. So that's why it took so long to show the timeout error. If I wasn't waiting that long, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't take that long. So that's basically the simplicity of this temperature sensor. There are other functions, and if you download the library, you can see the other functions. There's actually some sample code in with the uh, library when you download it as well. And uh, 
you look at the functions, there's there's other functions that do, uh, I can't remember what they even were now. There's more functions for conversions like the Fahrenheit and Celsius conversion and uh, a bunch more sensors type data you can get out of it. I believe one of them may even be like um, wind chill or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, but there were other functions that were very similar, similar to that. So that's our first project. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to our second project. And by the way, all this stuff is going to be in show notes on the website. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll point you to the library. I don't have any schematics created because I was running so late with the show, but I will get schematics created. And this is, like I said, all these are all very simple wiring diagrams, but I will get them created and put them up on the show notes as well so you can download those. Okay, so that was our first project, temperature sensor. And uh, before we go on to the second project, which is actually an accelerometer, uh, which is like your cell phone, and we'll get into showing you that. I wanted to talk, we had a couple people ask about the best place to buy this, and I don't really know this is the best place to buy it, but where I've been buying it from is Amazon. So what we've done to help you out is at the bottom of these show pages, um, we have links to the products that we talk about in the shows. So if you're interested in learning how to use a temperature sensor, or maybe an Arduino, or you want an Arduino Shield, something we've talked about, you can get all that stuff from the bottom of our page. But I want to be upfront selling you those links to Amazon, we do get a 4% commission on on those. Not, it's not a lot of money uh, as far as commission goes. And all, anything we make does come back into the Texan TV network to help pay for our bandwidth bills, things like that. But I do want you to know upfront that there is uh, a commission there coming to us. Like I said, it's, it's 4%, but it's an easy way, a quick way to find the products that uh, we talk about on the show. So. I want to hop over and start with the accelerometer. And you know, accelerometer is uh, a device that basically can tell you what way something is facing in different directions. Your phone, if you have a smartphone, has it in. When you turn your phone sideways, you notice it changes uh, different directions. Some games use the accelerometer. And uh, there was actually an accelerometer that we purchased and got working with the Arduino. So we're going to show it to you. I'm going to hop over to the Arduino. I'm going to swap out this one. And I'm going to plug in the accelerometer. So let me go ahead and plug this in. Now the project's already loaded on the Arduino, so this will be really quick. It's all start working right away. But the actual accelerometer is this thing right here. It's a little, it's a little board. And this is actually, the accelerometer itself is actually this little chip right here in the, in the center. And you can get these separately. This board's been designed to easily be worked, you know, for projects like this. So basically on this board, what you have is uh, on this side, you have your uh, five volts and your ground. And then there's a pin here that allows you to specify what accuracy you want. So I've experimented with this and I see a difference, but I don't know exactly what the difference is. And I'll show this in the, in the data as we get it. And then on the other side, we have um, X, Y, and Z. So X in this case is blue. Green is Y. I'm sorry, purple is Y. And green is Z. And then the last pin is like the sleep pin. So whenever this pin is low, the accelerometer will not work. So that allows you to, if you have a project that uses an accelerometer, you can keep turning it off and on so it's not constantly giving you data back, which helps save the battery. In my project, I've just turned it on. So um, I haven't gone through the whole process of writing a sleep routine for it. So let me go ahead and get this connected to our serial port. And through the magic of editing, the uh, 30 seconds or so that it took me to get this switched over, I'm switched over to my laptop. Now what you're seeing right here on the screen is the X, the Y, and the Z. And if we scroll down and we look at the code, We'll walk through the code real quick. So just ignore this bouncing around stuff over here. Basically what I've defined is the sleep pin. So like I said, the sleep pin, if this pin is low, the accelerometer is not functioning. So we gotta make sure we put that pin high. We have the high precision pin, which by default doesn't really, so it doesn't need to be connected. However, I have connected it and I've tried both the low and the high. I do see a difference whenever it's low or high, but to me, the precision isn't much more than what it was before. So but we'll talk about that here shortly. Then I have uh, the X pin, which I've stuck on analog zero, and these have to go into analog. And uh, that's because what it's returning you is a voltage level difference based on its direction that it's facing. 
So what you're reading is the analog value. Then we have a Y pin, and then we have a Z pin. Now I've used a zero, a one, and a two for those pins. I turn on, I set my baud rate for my serial monitor to 115-200. And if you come over to the serial monitor right here, you see my baud rate is 115-200. I take our sleep pin and I and make it an output. And then I turn that pin high, which basically turns on the accelerometer. In the event that you're trying to do some kind of battery saving technique, you want to you adjust this as and turn it on every second or every couple of seconds, which would save you some battery time. Then... Um, I come down to the X pin and I make it an input because these are all voltage inputs. And then I turn on the pull up resistor so that it's high when there's no uh, nothing on it. Then I do the same to the Y pin and the same to the Z pin. So that sets up our three pins to be inputs with a pull up resistor turned on. And then we get down to where the work actually happens. And you see I'm delaying uh, two seconds in the beginning, just for uh, mainly readability of the loop. I could have put this at the bottom, could have put it at the top, it doesn't really matter. And then I'm serial printing the analog read value of X pin, Y pin, and Z pin. So what you're seeing on the screen over here around in a circle is the reading for each of those. Now right now I'm not touching the accelerometer, so I'm going to go ahead and pick it up and you'll see the values just changed. But they didn't change that much. I just turned it 90 degrees. So you would have thought something would have changed. Now I'll turn it another 90 degrees. And it changed a little bit more. And now I'm gonna turn it another 90 degrees. And some things changed a little bit more. But for a 270 degree turn, the numbers didn't really change that much. So I'm going to bring it back to where it was, and I'm going to twist it a different direction. There is 90 degrees. There is 180 degrees. There's 270 degrees. So my, and I haven't read up on this to know what the actual value range is, but from my perspective, the value range is not that great. I would have thought it would a minimum would have been 360 based on the the degrees that you're turning it, if not more than that to make it more accurate. But in this case, it doesn't seem like it makes a difference. So that is with the, let's see, the high precision pin set to low. So what I want to do is I want to set the high precision to high and we'll see what the difference is. And let me fix another little bug that I had there. And let me go up here and set my board to the UNO. And I'm going to push this back out. Okay, it's up there. Let me turn back on the serial monitor. Okay, so there's our reading, and I'm going to pick it up. I just turned it 180 degrees. You see the numbers changed, but the precision, I mean, the numbers didn't change as much as before. That's why I'm thinking that the way I had it before was actually the right way for a larger precision. So I'm still, let me turn it this way. There's a 80 degree, 100, 100 degrees the other direction. And let me just say that the, uh, the chip on this thing gets a little warm. You gotta be careful when you hold it in your fingers. So let me go back and set this low again. So you see the range isn't much above 600. It's, you know, it's in the 600 range mainly. So let's turn this back to low and I'm going to push this out again. All right, it's uploaded. And go back to the serial monitor. So you already see immediately that the 730 is above the 600 range that we had before. So let me turn it nine degrees. So I do think when the pin is high, the precision is more. It still seems to me, and I'm still turning it around. <laughs> it still seems to me though that this is not something that is very accurate. And you see we're going into the 700s now, where before we weren't going that when the pin was low. So 500 to 700, so that's 200. 
I just don't think it's a 360 point precision. So I don't know what the precision will use. I'll have to figure that out at some other point. But um, again, this is what I was basically doing was just, you know, twisting it from this way. So there's the 180 degrees. And then I also did it this way. And then top 180. And the numbers to me are not as accurate. However, it definitely does give you what it's, what it's doing. What they determine X, Y, and Z, I haven't yet to play with it to figure that out. Like I said, the documentation on it's actually pretty poor. Uh, I have found some things online on people who have figured it out, but there's no special library required for this particular sensor. I mean, it's something you can, it's just that you're just reading the analog in right off of the, right off of the, the uh, board. So you get the voltage that's coming in and that's your value. And this, this chip outputs it in that, in that way. All right, so that is the accelerometer. And the other thing that it has that I did not uh, play with is there is a free, what's called a free fall sensor, which to me means if it detects that it's falling, I guess like the IBM laptops that used to fall and they'd lock the drive down, that type of sensor. So if it detected that it was falling, it would, um, it, the pin comes high. I did not try that. Um, I didn't find much documentation other than what it was supposed to, supposed to do. And because of the way I'm doing this, I don't want really to have an easy way. I make it drop it like that, I guess, and it would, it would go off, but I didn't want really to play with it that much. So the next one I want to do, or before I get to the next one, let me do this. I do want to um, let you know, if you're watching live, it's great, but if you're watching this recorded, you can watch this live. We've recently moved the show to Tuesday nights, where we normally record at 7 p.m. Tonight we got a little, little late start, but even if we're late, starting late, we generally have the uh, live stream going and you can kind of talk with us beforehand. Um, and while you're watching us live, it's awesome if you can get in the chat room and uh, chat with us. There's Chat room is right up here. I see it right up here, and I watch it, you know, pretty closely. And it's it's great to get feedback from people, especially as we are recording. And if you have questions about what we're doing, we can answer them like right here on the show. So it's it's great for us. Okay, so that was the accelerometer we just talked about. Let's get back and do the next sensor. The next one is interesting to me. Um, I have not quite figured it out, completely figured it out. All right, so let me unplug this one. The next one is a Keller sensor. So it's supposed to be very similar. Like if you take uh, a piece of paint or a wall into like Home Depot or Lowe's and they can Keller adjust for it. So this is uh, another Ar Arduino uh, Uno. So let me go ahead and get the serial port going while I'm doing this. I had the serial port running and before I go show you what it's outputting, I want to talk a little about the sensor. Now you notice there's four bright white LEDs on here, and this actually can be turned off. There is right now a jumper on here that's turning this on, and I can easily take this jumper like this and turn it off. But I think it's probably nice to have that because you can tell colors better with that turned on. So. In the middle of this chip, and actually I'll turn it off so you can see it until I'm done. I should let it unplug. In the middle of this board, right here is this sensor. So the way the sensor works is there's actually four sensors in there. The one sensor is clear, so it detects clear light. The other sensor is for red, for red, so it has like a red filter. The other one is a green filter, and the other one is a blue filter. So basically have four separate sensors and each one of them will tell you what kind of light it's getting behind that filter. So on the board you have your power on this side so you have your ground and your 5 volts and then on this side you have your colors and then you have two I'm calling them command pins for lack of a better word but the pins determine what color you want so it can read one color at a time. So you tell it what color you want, and it will start outputting the color. So you basically can only get one color at a time, and you'll notice in the program that when we do this, we actually um, have a wait period, and we go through each one, and it comes back uh, and gives you the output in pulses. So everything we have here is just digital, but it gives the output in pulses, like uh, pulse width modulation, as far as the strength of that particular color. So when we go through the code, you're gonna see this. So let me go ahead and uh, plug this 
back in so we get the white and then we get something here that has color to it we can play with so I'm actually going to use this to go across this coaster with different colors and stuff on it but let me switch over to the computer and you see I already have the color sensor code here on the screen and right here in the serial you're seeing that I'm sending out it's at zero 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 it's probably not getting anything right now but I'm going to stick it on the orange and one of the things I've noticed about the Arduino itself is it gets behind in sending out serial data when it's as busy as the pulse width modulation keeps it so give it a second here to catch up Okay, so as you see, I'm having issues with this uh, sensor, and this is not unusual for the sensor. Um, one of the things I've noticed is it seems like it's, the Arduino itself is um, very busy trying to keep up with this. So uh, I don't know if it's something that I was doing wrong with this. I'm just trying to write out a serial, which will go through what, what it does. And this is actually from an example that I found somewhere too. So I haven't really changed much on it. And you see right now it's not outputting uh, any information back to me. Let me just reset the Arduino. Oh, there it goes. Oh, so it's not outputting any data. All right, so let's go through the program. And what we have here is we are um, setting up the different pins that we're going to use for the data collection and then also the uh, output control pins and we have counters and the way this works is it's actually doing a counter the number of pulses so this count R count G and count B is how many pulses it got in a short period of time so this is how we try to determine what our numbers are so the numbers for R are between 0 and 255 the number for G is between 0 and 255, and the number for blue is between 0 and 255. So that's where we define all of our, our initial values up here. And then in our setup, we're turning on the um, serial port at 115, 200, and we're setting pin S0, S1, S2, and S3 to output. And then we create a subroutine called TSC, and all what this is doing is it's setting up the pins. So what S1 and S0 high do, and then the two lows, the two lows say I want to read the red color. So the two highs are telling it to read. And then we attach an interrupt routine, which is this ISR underscore into, and then we set our, our, our timer. So what the interrupt is doing is while this timer is running, which you'll see it's 10 millisecond timer, which we'll go through this down here in a little bit, but while this timer is running, we want to count for every interrupt and we want to um, add it to the counter. So the interrupt, the timer happens. So basically down here when we set the timer, this is the clock frequency and then we want 10 milliseconds and then we want to turn on the interrupt. And then the interrupt comes down here and you see it go through and it says what the flag is. So the flag, this and the flag is part of this whole routine. So every time this, this function goes off, this, vec, this uh, interrupt timer goes off, it comes down here and says, what am I looking for right now? So flag one is red, which is what the low low was. So we set it to low, low, we set it to pulse, and we wait 10 milliseconds, and in that 10 milliseconds, we, we wait for the counter, see how many you know, pulses we get back in that 10 milliseconds. We come down here and we set, when it's low, low, counter is equal to one, or flag is equal to one, we can then say that the red counter is equal to this counter value, and then we want to set the pins S2 and S3 high, high, and that's going to read the green. So we, we fall through our if statement, we get down to the bottom, 
and this actually is not part of the if statement. Let's put it back it up so it doesn't look like it is. We set our counter back to zero. And then we go through this whole process again. We go through the 10 millisecond wait again. So we just keep doing this over and over again. Um, and you see here we set, after we get the green counter, we set low, S2 to low and S3 to high. That's telling it to, I want to read the blue. So then we come down here, we set our counter equal to zero and we wait for 10 milliseconds and our timer to go off again. And then we fall back into this loop because the timer went off and we come back and it says, I'm now flag three because I'm reading blue, set my blue counter, set it back to low, low, which is red. And then we fall through. And then we, the next time the timer goes off, the, the flag um, is set back to zero and we start it all over again. So this is a little confusing because we've never really dealt with interrupts before on this show, but the whole purpose of an interrupt is to have the processor stop what it's doing and immediately go do this process. So in this case, we really have two types of interrupts. We have the one that is defined right here, attach interrupt, and it calls um, this ISR into, and what it does is every time the pin, you get a uh, cycle on the pin, it comes down to this routine and adds one to the counter. So that's one type of, that's the physical interrupt. So this is one type of interrupt. Then we have the other interrupt, which is a timer. So what we do in the timer interrupt is we define this timer and we set it to its length to be 100 mil, uh, 10 milliseconds. And we basically uh, turn it on by putting a zero one here. So every um, hundred mil, or every 10 milliseconds, it's going to fire off. So right here, what we've done is we said that this is what I want you to do when this interrupt happens. And then here's where we do all our adding up of numbers. So after we set our pins to low, low, or low, high, or high, low, whichever one we're going to do, we wait 10 milliseconds and we wait to see how many counts we get in 10 milliseconds. And that's the value of the color that's coming in. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice, and let me do a, a change here, Let's see if this helps any, is we're right now getting a bunch of zeros, which I'm not sure why that is. Let me make sure I have all my connections tight. Everywhere. And we're still getting, and you see it just pauses. So this is a similar problem I was having yesterday with the Arduino itself. It seems like it just kind of locks up for a while and I'm not sure what it's doing. But the uh, it appears that everything is functioning correctly on the sensor itself. I'm just not getting colors. Let me go look at different color ones see what I get. All right, so there we're getting numbers. You see 116, red, green, 193. So it took me actually powering off the uh, sensor itself and turning it back on. So let me change colors. Um, I'm tempted to put a display on this just to see if what it's actually doing. If Because it may actually be functioning normally, just that the serial output routine is not functioning the way that it's supposed to. And you see I'm getting all zeros back again. So I'm not sure. I think, oh, they're getting numbers. So. Um, it appears it doesn't like being on a surface tightly. So let me flip the coaster back over to the bright side. You can see there I'm getting numbers there now. Nope, nothing. All right, so you see the frustration that I'm having with this. I will continue to play with the sensor. And if I do figure it out uh, and get to work a little bit better, I was hoping this worked because I actually was going to, um, I was thinking about building a, a robot that would follow colored lines, which would allow, um, us to create a robot that would follow, uh, you, so you have multiple lines, multiple robots, one would follow one color line, one would follow the other color line, and then be able to cross over paths. But um, I'm not having much luck with the sensor so far, as you can tell. Um, I had more luck last night, but it still was not making sense. It was like, even though it wasn't moving, the numbers would constantly be changing. So it could be something, it could be a bad sensor, but I'm not sure. Hooking it up is not difficult. Um, it's a little difficult to go through the program to figure out what it's doing, but, um, I'll, I'll better comment what I wrote, and you can, I'll put that out there in the show notes, and you can you know, try to follow it and see. Um, it's not horrible to understand. After you 
understand how it works. And it's just, all you got to remember is in a 10 millisecond period of time, it's going to pulse out how many, a number. So if, say the value for red is, is 230. In 10 milliseconds, it's going to pulse 230 times. So that's what the program is doing. And the values are between 0 and 255. So by theory, I should be able to take a number from the three numbers that I'm getting from it, put it into something like Photoshop, and get the color that it's looking at. However, based on what I've got back, that is not the case. And that's not what I'm getting. So um, more to come on the sensor. So, But I want to, to, to show you the sensor and tell you a little bit about what it does. Um, like I said, you see these kind of things when... Um, you're in like Home Depot or Lowe's because they want to match your paint color. And it's the same type of sensor, it's just that this one doesn't seem to be working as well as those hopefully are working. Before we go on to the last two sensors, and the last two sensors I put into one project, so this goes a little quickly, and this is actually a very fun one. I had a lot of fun playing with this one. Um, and this was one of the last minute ones as well, but this one worked the, the way that it was supposed to work, not like the color temperature one. So um, before we go to that, I wanted to um, remind you that you can get the show. You can subscribe to us uh, on iTunes or any other of the podcatcher services. We're on Stitcher now as well. Anywhere you can subscribe. But getting by subscribing, you get the downloads automatically. And you can play them on all kinds of devices. You're carrying your iPhone or Android around, and you want to listen to it as you're driving down the road, or you want to put it in your iPad or something and watch it. Uh, you can get us all over the place, and it downloads all automatically. You don't even got to think about it. So you get all the updates and all the episodes from Let's Make It all completely automatically hands off. But if you're watching this on YouTube, you know, there's a subscribe button there too. And that's another great thing to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you get updates that way. But if you want it on the go, the best thing to do is to go and subscribe to iTunes. Now, we are also now available on TiVo. So if you have a TiVo at home and you want to watch us on your big screen, go to TiVo and we're listed in TiVo as one of the shows. And we are also have a app that is for, for Roku and soon an iPad, iPhone, and Android app as well. So you can get us multiple places. And if you like what you're getting here or you have a, have a suggestion, please let us know. But also tell your friends. That's the best way for us to get the word around is you. So if you do like it and you have some friends that you think you would enjoy it, you know, let them know about us. That's definitely appreciated. All right, so on to our last project. Like I said, this is all done on one Arduino. I have two sensors on one Arduino. So let me go ahead and switch over on the Arduino. So I'm going to unplug this one and put it out of the way. And I'm gonna need this coaster for this next one. And let me get this one out of the way. And we're going to bring in the Leonardo. So we need to swap out our cables here too. Let me plug this in. All right, the Leonardo lit up, that's a good sign. Let me make a few changes on the Arduino software. Switch our board over to Leonardo and our serial port, get that reassigned. And this is another one where I'm going to use the serial monitor. And the more I do this, the more likely I am in the future to actually do an LCD display because going back and forth to the computer is difficult. So I want to talk about the sensors that I have here. This one, you could probably guess what it is by looking at it. It has like a little uh, fly eye thing on top, but this is a motion sensor. So what this does is it detects motion and it's very simple. There are some adjustments on it right here. You can make it more or less sensitive. I have not adjusted these at all for this. It just worked as I got it. And on the other side, there is three pins. You have your ground, your five volts, and the pin that comes high when it senses motion. Couldn't get much simpler than that. So we'll talk about this one. The other one is probably one you've seen around. I've seen a lot of these on websites everywhere, and it's a distance sensor. So it's limited to, I believe, three meters, and it's probably what, close to three yards. Um, 
and no, it's six feet, six feet maximum. So um, it doesn't go real far. You could use it for like sizing up a room, but this works great if you got some kind of robotic. It looks like little eyes. See those little, little eyes. But it works great if you got some like little robot that wants to determine the the where the wall is and things like that. So, and to demonstrate this, I actually have a a ruler that I'm going to use and something that's sticking its way. And we're going to demonstrate how accurate it really is. So it's pretty impressive how accurate it is. I was, I was rather impressed. So um, the next thing here I want to do is switch over to the computer. And here's the program. And I call this presence and distance. So we have three variables at the very top. We have our pin that detects movement. Basically, like I said, the pin comes high when it detects any kind of movement. And we're going to monitor that pin. Then we have our trigger and echo pin. And then the trigger and echo pin are used by the distance sensor to determine how far away something is. And it really is pretty much what it says it is. It's the trigger um, it basically turns on the output, and then you turn it off, and then you wait for the echo to come high. And you time how long it takes for that to happen. And based on that time, you know how far away something is. And it, it's pretty simple. There's a little math involved I had to go look up to figure out how to do, but um, it overall is pretty simple. So let's go through the program. We set up our, our uh, statics right here. And in setup, we're going to turn on our serial port to 115200, and you see it over here, it's going. In fact, it's telling you that right now there's something five inches in front of the device. We set our trigger pin to output, because that's what we're going to say when we want to send out noise to figure out how far away it is. I also have set up the uh, movement pin, which is the other sensor, as an input pin, and then the echo pin, which is the return from the trigger, as an input as well. And in the loop, we need to know the duration of the, or the number of microseconds it took for it to come back, and the distance is something we're going to calculate. So we need to have these two defined, and they are long integers. And then we are going to write to trigger pin low, wait two microseconds, set the, the trigger pin high, which means it's going to transmit for 10 microseconds, and then we're going to set the trigger pin low. And then we're going to read in the echo pin in pulses. So this is pulse width modulation, which is something we'll talk about in the future of how you can control servos, and we'll talk about a little more about what pulse width modulation is. It's used a lot um, more than what people realize, but basically what it's going to do is it's just going to return a number. And that number is then for inches is divided by 148 to get the distance. And then we print out the distance and in inches. If, it, uh, if you're doing uh, centimeters, I believe it was 58 is what I calculated it to be, 57, 58, something like that. And it'll return centimeters. And then after we print out the distance, we're going to read our pin, and if our pin is high, you're going, we're going to print out movement detected, and we put a blank line, we wait two seconds, and we do it all over again. So I'm going to move, first of all, the motion sensor. Actually, you see, I'm moving my hand in front of it, and it just said over here on the serial thing, movement detected. So there it is again. It's seeing me move around it. So it's very quiet. You don't hear it clicking like a relay or something like that, like some of the motion sensors do in your home it just quietly turns on the pin. So there's, it is a very quiet thing. So now the other thing, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this a little bit, which you're not, let me uh, switch back over to this and you see my ruler. And I'm going to set it right here and I'm going to put this coaster at four inches, just like so. And then I'm going to switch back over to the computer. And if you look on the serial monitor, what's it saying? Oh, four inches now, or three inches. All right, I'm going to do four inches. And we go back over, and you see I'm at four inches. Well, you can't see where my hand's at, but I'm only at four inches. So it's pretty accurate. Let's say I want to go out to eight inches. There we go. I'm at, I'm at like eight and an eighth. So maybe my zero is not starting where I thought it was. 
one me on the edge of it. Yeah. So uh, if I come up to, to two inches, there's two inches. So it's very accurate. And you can see what I was doing, but there's, this is why I need to put a display on it. Because there was two inches. Let's go back. All right, two inches, two inches. We'll go to four inches. It's right there, four inches. So you can see it's very accurate. And it's, uh, it's like I said, it's up to a, just a few feet. It doesn't go really far. So it wouldn't be good for, like I said, measuring anything of any great distance. Um, right now it's, if you switch, I switched over, you see it's saying 50 some in 53 inches. So it's, you know, seeing a ways, almost five feet. And I think it could be the wall. I don't think it's quite the wall. Okay, so this is a great fun little toy to play with, especially if you're trying to uh, do, <laughs> play a trick on your roommate. You can tell when they walk in the room. You can do all kinds of things. You can play sounds when you detect movement, all that kind of stuff. The uh, distance sensors are great for if you're building a little robot. There's plenty of kits out there that uh, have little robot attachments on them. You can add some intelligence to it. So this one's going to run into the wall. Like I said, it doesn't work for great distances, but if you're trying to run up against the wall, you definitely would know. And you saw me put it on a measurement there. It's pretty accurate as well as far as the actual distance from the front. And uh, what I found was the distance is actually from not the front of the sensor, but from where the element is in the sensor. So as I was playing with it here, and uh, through the mention of editing, you didn't see me do this, but it's uh, where I put the, the measurement later on was actually the better place for it and a little bit more accurate. And that's basically where the sound is probably coming from in the back. So that's probably where the accuracy comes in. But these are very easy. Uh, to work with. I mean, there wasn't no special libraries required to use either one of these two sensors. In fact, the one is just basically a high pin, which is very easy to look at. And the other one is such a timing pulse width modulation, which is something that the Arduino is built to do. So it doesn't require any special libraries at all, like some of the other things we've been doing. And um, as I mentioned before, I will come back and revisit the Keller, temp the Keller sensor because I am intrigued by that one and I have something I'd like to try to do with it. So I'm going to spend some time on that um, outside of the hour-long show or how long this was tonight to get that to work because I would like to try to create some roving robots that follow different color lines and can cross over each other's lines where if you just followed white or black you wouldn't be able to cross over you get confused and I think it'd be pretty easy to do um, we actually are going to talk about some robotic stuff here coming up I'm already ordering some of the parts for it um, and that's that's just on its way the bulk of it's on its way as, and so in the future, we will talk about some robots, and I think we can do some things with it and build upon a small, fun robot that would be like a little kit you could uh, build just to learn how the Arduino works and write code for it. Actually, it'd be good for kids, too, because the Arduino is very easy to use, uh, um, and just getting used to the uh, the C language is the most difficult part, really. So um, that's kind of all I want to go over tonight. That's five sensors. Well, I guess technically it's four sensors, or one didn't work, or for working one not working properly working sensors for the evening i do want to remind you like i said before there if you want any of the stuff that we talked about on the show tonight you can go to the bottom of the show page or any of our show pages for let's make it and we're going to have links to products on amazon to get the exact products that we were talking about tonight and that's already on there now so if you're watching this if you're watching it live you can go down there and scroll down and uh and get that so um I do want to talk about a little bit about our community. We have created a community on Google that uh, Google Communities and under Google um, G Plus, where we basically click on the community link. It's on our website, and you can talk to other viewers of Texan TV and talk about the Arduino. Uh, I'm in there all the time. Um, not much activity here recent, but we're trying to change that. It's a new community for us, and like the. Uh, get that growing so if you are watching us you know go out and watch or go out and participate in the google plus community we also do have a fan page on um, facebook as well you can get to that from the main show page if you want to go out there we do post updates about our shows um, each show has their own twitter and facebook accounts as well uh, and we as we put um, content up or new releases or announcements of what we're going to be working on then you can get that by just following us on either Twitter or on the community page. And lastly, before we let you go, 
Uh, I want to talk about show ideas. I have a bunch of show ideas coming up, but I'd love to hear your show ideas because the best thing I can do is do shows that you want to see. And I have shows that I would like to do, but if you have something specific, I'd love to do them. So there are many ways you can contact us. If you go to the show page, you can actually contact us via Google Voice. You can call us and leave us a voicemail. Don't worry, nobody's ever going to be there to answer that, so don't get surprised by that. Um, you can also, at the website, while you're there, you can contact us via email. You get all the other uh, details about the show uh, as far as how you can contact us or make show suggestions. All the show notes are out there. They're out there generally the same day the show goes live, sometimes even before. That is our goal. Um, we try to get very hardly to get that stuff out there um, as it's, it's released. We do record the show live on Tuesday nights now at 7 p.m. and we try to have it on produced and up by Wednesday evening or Thursday morning. It's uh, after we get it edited, it's kind of an automatic thing where it kind of does on its own. It just takes computer time to get it all uploaded and things like that. Uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Give us uh, give us some ideas what you want to talk about in the future. We'd love to hear that. And I do appreciate your time uh, watching us tonight. And please come back next week. I'm not sure what my subject is next week. I have a long list of them, and it kind of depends on, I think, what parts I get in. Uh, but in the future, we're going to talk about uh, integrating Arduinos and Androids together, different ways of doing that. We're going to focus a little bit on the Leonardo. One of the reasons I got the Leonardo is it can emulate a keyboard. So we want to talk about some items with that as well. And some of this may even spill in over to some of our other shows uh, where we want to build tools for some of the other shows. Um, and we'll probably use the Arduino for that too. I am still working on the project that I mentioned in the first couple episodes. Uh, it's It's been, I won't say it's on hold, it's been going slow because of uh, building out the new studio and everything. We're just a little bit behind on the time that I had to work on that kind of stuff. But I will come back to that as well. And that actually involves a Zigbee. And I may talk about Zigbee very soon before, in t just to show you how it works and how it works with the Arduino and some things you can do before I actually get into talking about the... Uh, actual product that we're trying to create using the Zigbee protocol as well. So we have a lot of things planned, um, a whole bunch of project ideas, uh, things you can play with, uh, and then learn the Arduino as well. And uh, that's all coming up in the future. But again, I'd love to hear uh, all of, all of your, uh, all your ideas. And in fact, if you want to send us a video, you can record it, stick it on YouTube or Vimeo or somewhere like that. Just send us a link to it. Don't try to send us a video. Our email doesn't take big attachments, so we probably wouldn't get it anyways but we'd love to watch your video if you send them to us. So definitely appreciate uh, anything you want to give us as far as show ideas, comments, feedback. We love it all. This show is done uh, with our passion, but it's, it's for you. So, all right, that's it for Let's Make It for this week. We'll see you next week.